Got a Fort Knox update here. I am John Fort uh, back. It's been a while, but back with Avi Ramesh, the uh, CEO of Mitzfits Market. Big deal to announce today, planned acquisition of Imperfect Foods. And I call it big because, um, you know, you're both technically startups and uh, Imperfect just did a sizable funding round, more than $100 million not too long ago. So tell me, how did this uh, acquisition come about? Yeah, um, well, this is, uh, it's been something that the two teams have been talking about and working on for, for a few months now. And ultimately, you know, I think both Imperfect and Misfit share, um, kind of share a vision for the food supply chain and for online grocery. And our view is that there's a huge opportunity to tackle food waste, um, to build a more sustainable supply chain and use that to drive access and affordability to the end consumer. Um, and so, you know, as Imperfect was kind of going through their uh, their, their capital raise process recently, um, you know, we sort of entered the conversation and, and we had a, an honest discussion about whether something more strategic would make sense, not only for their business, but also for us. Uh, and then things kind of moved pretty quickly from there. And the, the conclusion was, uh, we entered into a definitive agreement to uh, to acquire them um, a, a couple of days ago. Uh, of course, this still needs to get through regulatory approval and all that kind of good stuff. Um, we're hopeful that's efficient. Uh, but we're excited. We, we think this is, um, you know, we have the opportunity to build a, a large, sustainable online grocery store. Um, and that, you know, by doing this, I think we mentioned this in the press release as well, this is a path to scale and to profitability for our business. Um, and, and that's something that, I would argue, you know, no other or few other online grocery platforms uh, have yet to show the market, and we believe we can be the first ones. How did today's economic pressures, including inflation, influence the uh, attractiveness of a combination and scale? Um, it was a really big part of it, in a nutshell, for, for a couple of different reasons. One. Um, you know, in food inflation in particular, as we, you and I have talked about before, is really impacting the consumer, especially the, the sort of like mid, middle and lower end consumer. And th those consumers are looking for, um, for, for more affordable options. And, you know, we've always been that on the Misfit side, Imperfect's kind of been that as well in, in the geographies they're in. And our view is that by combining, we're going to be able to actually substantially reduce a lot of costs to our customers. Uh, things like free shipping thresholds, Lower cart minimums, lower lower prices on a lot of core, uh, you know, produce, meat, and seafood commodities. That will be an outcome of this uh, of this combination. And I'd say neither company standalone would be able to sort of command that type of outcome, but together we'll be able to. So that's a huge part of 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 what's um, you know what's underlying this this uh, this acquisition. How is this going to affect the efficiency and effectiveness of your marketing? I can imagine that because uh, misfits and uh, imperfect were similar, some amount of your marketing was spent butting heads, like trying to take customers from each other, or at least potential customers from each other. Now it seems you'd be more focused on capturing a customer that wasn't necessarily going to come to either, but have you calculated that out? Yes, we have. And, and that's also a big part of this as well. To, to that exact point, you know, we've, we've, we've never really viewed each other as direct competitors, although people tend to kind of draw that conclusion really quickly. The reality of it is Imperfect and Misfits are more so allies and the real competitors are all the brick and mortar grocery retailers out there. If you, if you look at grocery more broadly, it's a $950 billion annual consumer spend industry. Less than 12% is online today. And that 12% um, is, is dominated by the large retailers, the brick and mortar leg legacy retailers. Us, Imperfect, the other e-commerce upstarts, we're tiny, tiny fish in that pond. Um, and so a, a big part of what this will do by uniting brands and by being a single company, we'll be able to get better customer acquisition costs. We'll have uh, clearer brand awareness uh, over time with a single brand. And, um, you know, that I think will, will, will give us a lot more leverage in the market. So that, that is a very big part of it. How are you going to handle the brand? I don't know if you've calculated sort of brand loyalty. If the imperfect brand goes away, is that customer going to resent it? Uh, I, I imagine the Misfits brand isn't going away since you guys are doing the ones, you, you guys are the ones who are doing the, the acquiring. But um, I, I know you said that these two brands are going to be distinct at least for a while. But even beyond that, what are the risks in letting one of these brands go? Well, your point exactly. There's a lot of customer loyalty for both brands today, right? Imperfect has been around for seven years. We've been around for four years. 
So there are hundreds of thousands of customers across the country who know these brands, who trust these brands. So we are, you know, we're in no rush to go and, and change that tomorrow. Uh, and in fact, we've made it pretty clear, both brands will it coexist, uh, they'll operate independently for some period of time. Um, and the first goal for us is to actually, even with both brands being distinct and separate, is to, to get the best of both worlds to the other customers, right? So when it comes to things like assortment, customer experience, delivery experience, both businesses have built different core competencies and different things that are good for each, each set of customers. So we first want to combine that and say, hey, if you're an imperfect customer, you get all the great things that Misfits has. If you're a Misfits customer, you get all the great things that imperfect customers have. So we're going to start there. Then there's a longer term brand strategy. And we first want to, you know, we want to make sure that there are negative repercussions that the longer term brand strategy, which will involve uniting the brands under one umbrella. Uh, transparently, I think there's still a lot of discussion to be done around what that looks like. Do we do a, a parent brand and a sub brand? Do we keep the name? Do we change names? I think there's a lot of discussion still, um, but it's more of a longer term brand strategy to do that. What do you do about the workforce? Um, we're heading into, it seems, an increasingly uncertain, at least, economic situation, especially when it comes to employment. And um, there might be some overlap. I'm not clear on the different logistics and fulfillment networks that these companies have. How are you going to handle that? Yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing about this acquisition, um, unlike a lot of other M&A things that other companies have done, this doesn't hinge on workforce reduction. Um, and, and so I don't say that to say, oh, we will never consider that and that there's no overlap. The reality of it is there, there is going to be overlap on some, on some teams. We're two really big organizations. We each have close to 1,500 employees. So combined, this is a 3,000 person organization. There will be some places where there's going to be overlap. But you know, my, my point is layoffs and reductions are not the core part of this integration. The core part of this integration and, and the synergy is really more about operations, logistics, assortment. Um, it's about kind of like blending infrastructure. That's kind of at the, at the core of what this is about. Um, and, and so we're going to come up with a, with a more detailed integration plan, look at every team, um, kind of, you know, see where there's overlap, all that kind of good stuff. But that isn't necessarily sort of tier one where the value, where the value accretion is going to come from here. How is the ownership structure and investor structure, board structure of this combined company, uh, you know, if, if it does combine, you, you gave all the caveats about regulatory approvals. How is that going to shift? Um, so the, the Misfits corporate structure will remain intact. The Misfits board will remain intact. Uh, I will serve as chief executive of, of the combined uh, entity. Importantly, there's going to be leadership from both sides. So uh, Imperfect's built, um, it's an incredible deep uh, bench of talent on the executive team there. Uh, and we're excited to welcome um, a, a very large chunk of them over to our side. So we're gonna have a joint leadership team, but the board governance corporate structure all remains uh, the, the same as is today on the Misfit side. Um, and then, you know, important point on the stakeholder side, this is largely a stock transaction, uh, which means that all, uh, you know, all slash most imperfect shareholders get moved over to the, uh, to, to the Misfits cap table, uh, employee options get moved over all of that. And so in terms of balance that I don't imagine that there were necessarily any investors who had invested in both because that would probably be a conflict. But um, what does that do to uh, dilution uh, to, you know, when it comes to leadership, when it comes to employees? Well, you know, both organizations are taking dilution as part of this because it's a stock transaction. Um, so, you know, mis misfit shareholders, myself, investors, they're all taking dilution. Imperfect shareholders, employees, investors are taking dilution as well. The I think what we all saw pretty early on was having a smaller piece of a much bigger pie um, is really what makes this attractive. And you know, when, when you look at kind of the the detailed merger model we've put in place, it very clearly shows the one plus one here isn't two. It isn't even two point five. It's probably three point five or four. And that's really what's in incredibly exciting for me and for all the shareholders around the table is standalone. Both these companies could have been successful, that there were clear standalone paths for imperfect and for misfits, but combined, um, the path is, you know, the opportunities are enormous. Uh, we, 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 you know, we put this in the press release, we have the ability to go get to north of a billion dollars in sales and be a profitable company, which 
again, hasn't really happened in online grocery yet at scale. Um, and, and so there's so much value creation that comes out of that such that it accounts for and offsets any of the dilution we're talking about. What does this do for the move beyond produce that you and I talked about the last time we talked in expansion, perhaps into other categories? I mean, longer term, it seems like that would be more possible with scale. But then in the near term, you got integration issues that are going to be a focus. The, um, the, the amazing thing is Imperfect's done um, a fantastic job of building out a, a pretty compelling grocery assortment on their side. Um, and, and one of the things we're excited about integrating as well is their, their private brand. So they've built a, a really compelling private label with, uh, I, think, I believe it's over 100 different private label items spanning the entire grocery spectrum, meat and seafood, dairy, staple grocery, canned goods, produce even. And so if anything, I think this kind of accelerates the path to, to, to become a, becoming a full grocery store online for, for Misfits because we'll get the best of our assortment, which we've been super focused on scaling out to our earlier discussions, and we'll get to, to, to add uh, the, the robust, imperfect assortment, which includes a ton of these private label items, which you know, on a separate note, a lot of consumers are, are looking at private label now as a viable option given, given food inflation, given that, that, that desire to look for value, quality of value and private labels becoming more and more important. So um, I actually think that despite all the integration challenges and the time and effort it'll take, I think category expansion will accelerate. So then at some point, do, do, do you, does the combined company outgrow the sort of uh, brand, the initial brand, um, I don't want to call it a promise because it's not exactly, but this idea that there's some flaw that's caused this thing to be more affordable. Right? Once you start getting more into packaged goods, once you're getting into private label, isn't it a different kind of value proposition? It's different in that the definition of misfit or ugly or flawed expands. Um, but it's the same in that our, our, our ethos has always been, let's tackle inefficiency because there's a ton of it in the food supply chain. And let's go turn that inefficiency into value for the consumer. And when we first started, that inefficiency was very narrowly defined. It was just ugly produce. It was apples that were too small and asparagus that were too skinny. And yes, we've definitely expanded out of that, purely out of that definition. That's still a big part of what we do. But the reality of it is there are so many other pockets of food waste and food inefficiency in our food system, so much so that I don't think we're really going to run out of, of, of space. If anything, you know, I, I think the way we think about it is we're going to look at things differently as Misfits Market. Um, and one of the brands that we look up to a lot is Trader Joe's. And, and, you know, Trader Joe's had a similar ethos back in the founding days where they essentially said, we're going to do things differently. We're going to source differently. We're going to merchandise differently. We're going to price differently. And that's ultimately what drove a competitive advantage for them. And I kind of view us as, as, as similar in that, we're going to do things differently in supply chain. We're going to find all these pockets of inefficiency and bring them to market. Um, and so the definition of inefficiency expands a little bit, but there's still inefficiency. And that's how we're going to get value to our customers. Um, that's quite a vision and uh, a, a challenge and an opportunity to combine two cultures. The, the one that you're acquiring is, is older, right? Uh, and create a new definition uh, of this at the same time. What's your goal date for this integration phase pending approvals to be done and for you to be hitting the gas on the next phase? Um, there will be a few different stages. I would say in general, we're looking at, you know, roughly a, a 12 month plan to, to get these, you know, to get these two businesses integrated. There are certainly things that will come a lot sooner than that. And there are things that will take a little more than 12 months, just given the size of these organizations. But I, you know, we're circling 12 months on the calendar and saying the goal is to get these two businesses largely integrated over the next year. Um, and, and we're going to start with, like I said, bringing the best of both worlds, the customers on the both side, uh, on both sides, integrating operations, integrating logistics, all that kind of great stuff. Um, and, but, you know, again, this is a large, these are two very large businesses on paper. It's close to 3000 employees combined. Um, uh, eight fulfillment centers, um, dozens of smaller cross stock centers. Imperfect has 450 plus delivery vans. So it is a it is a big operational uh, endeavor, but we think we have the team to do it. It's going to take a little bit of time. All right. Lots to do. Uh, exciting for those who are looking for more efficiency and better prices in this inflationary environment for some essential goods like food. Abi, thanks for joining me for this update. Thank you.